Hey guys, welcome to our uh, Facebook Live and the Human Interactive Lounge. I am joined today, a very interesting, rare occasion, by Renee, my lovely wife and uh, all-knowing person of technology. So hopefully this is going to work, um, and if not, we can all blame her. Uh, and on the phone today is an amazing friend of mine, and Michelle used to drive down here from Fresno to do a lot of work with me. And <clears throat> Michelle has a really amazing story that I wanted her to share that I think everybody needs to know, especially now with all that's going on um, in the mental health world uh, with kids and teens and young adults. And in the town that we are in, mental health care services are very, very difficult to get, if not impossible. And Michelle's story um, with regards to her son is one that I think is a game changer. And the hope is, is that uh, Michelle can share her story and we can take action and we can move forward to make all kinds of changes in the state um, that will help everybody that suffers from a mental health illness. So Michelle, I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it so much. Yeah. Anything that we can do to get your story out there, because I think it can help so many people. Um, where do we begin? Oh, well, um, we can talk about the LPS law, or we can. I can start with my son's story. You let me know what you want me to do. Well, I think that talking about his story might be good first and then mm -hmm. maybe you can help me understand some of the technical things that we're trying to get changed um, in the law and in um, the government with regards to mental health so yeah I'd love to hear okay. about your son tell me tell me about him okay um, my son Dejan Reed um, he passed away in July of 2019 he was 24 years old um, basically my son um, had been diagnosed with schizophrenia and bipolar and he had developed a substance abuse um, issue that had been going on for about three or four years before he passed away and I believe it was due to trying to self-medicate because his medication was not exactly where it needed to be um, he was displaying signs um, of a mass psychosis, and, and basically that's when mental health uh, patients with schizophrenia and bipolar, they have something similar to dementia. And so they don't have the insight to understand that they need treatment and that they need medication. They think they're completely fine. Um, and so when he was a child, I'll, I'll back up. When he was a child, he was diagnosed with auditory processing issues. And in his teen years, he was diagnosed with ADHD. Um, but he passed away on the 27th um, at 4 a.m. He was um, on the train tracks, I was told, and um, the train had blared the horn several times to try to get him off, and he was holding his hands in a prayer position, um, and he was struck and killed by the train. Now, this is less than nine months after a judge uh, released him from a temporary LPS conservatorship against psychiatric recommendations to keep him for nine months to a year. Um, I was told that the judge released him in an LPS conservatorship. He was on a temporary LPS conservatorship and he was hospitalized. He was released by the judge because he presented well uh, in court. And um, basically he had no criminal record. Um, uh, when he was a child, he was, you know, loved by many, he was very loving, kind and gentle, uh, give you the shirt off his back, had, you know, a smile like the sunshine, and you couldn't miss his loving disposition. Um, he was a really great kid, uh, never gave me an ounce of trouble. He wanted to be an actor, and he wrote a lot of stories when he was a little boy um, that he wanted to put into a film. Uh, he could, he could pinpoint accuracy, mimic others in a comical way. He was just full of life and joy and laughter. And um, he started having depressive symptoms and anxiety symptoms when he was 15. Um, but by the time he turned 18, he began to have auditory and visual hallucinations. And uh, I basically watched his personality disintegrate. 
Um, he cycled in and out of hospitals, um, you know, on 5150. Some of them he went willingly, and then later it became to the point where he had to go uh, involuntarily. So, Michelle, when he was younger and he was um, diagnosed with ADHD and auditory mm -hmm. processing disorder, did the school evaluate him? Like, did he have an individualized educational plan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, he was showing signs of dyslexia and um, he was falling behind in his studies. And so I did have him tested, but they weren't the ones who told me that he had ADHD. They pointed out the auditory, auditory processing issues. I mean, I took him uh, to see a psychiatrist who later diagnosed him in teen years with ADHD and said that he should have been diagnosed with that a long time ago. So school was challenging for him? Yes, it was challenging, um, but he didn't really start uh, struggling as much until, he did struggle, but he struggled more when he became a teenager. Yeah, and as a teenager, did he, was he able to get any help through like counseling or the school or anything like that? Yeah, unfortunately, um, he was, he started showing signs of depression and anxiety, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't very clear what was going on because he, he hit a lot of things. Um, my son was the type of person that he kept a lot of things to himself. Um, so he was feeling sad, but I only found out about this because I had found his journal. And um, I, you know, in my face, he would smile to me and everything was just fine. Um, but he was, I found his journal where he was writing about how he was feeling and he never really told me. So he, he could present like everything was okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he did for a long time. And, um, because and when I found his journal, he had wrote, you know, things like when he was like really little, he felt like just killing himself. He felt like, you know, he was sad all the time. Um, I had found out when he was 18 that there was some um, sexual abuse um, that I, I had no idea about. Um, and so he had never told me. Yeah. yeah. Well, and a, 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 a lot of people might wonder, well, how could you miss that? I mean, from, from what I do, kids, kids are really good at hiding stuff. Kids are really good at looking like the life of the party when inside they're really kind of falling apart. Mm -hmm. And not only that, it wasn't it wasn't a male perpetrator; it was a female. Yeah, and so even that wouldn't get anybody's attention necessarily. Right, <clears throat> right. So a lot of these things seem like, at the time, maybe benign, or you know, people might overlook them because of his innocent portrayal. I mean, we're looking at a photograph of him on um, screen right now, and he just looks like a kid that would be you know, personality, voted personality plus in the yearbook. Mm-hmm. He was very, very kind to everyone. I mean, a lot of his classmates uh, ended up finding me after he passed away, and they sent me many messages about how he greeted everybody with a smile, and, and if you had an issue, he would sit and listen to you and try to help you figure it out. And, you know, it goes back to saying that, you know, not everybody that's smiling is okay, you know, and, and people who reach out to those who are hurting are usually hurting themselves yeah um when was he first uh hospitalized oh it wasn't until i believe like 17 um that he really started having really severe symptoms that he couldn't hide anymore and um basically he would come in the room and say to me did you call me or you know did you say something and he just started started off like that and then i noticed it happening more frequently um but it also got to the point where he had become so depressed that he wouldn't get out of the bed he didn't want to take a shower he didn't want to eat and so i would have to go in there and you know make sure he got up make sure he got something to eat because he would literally just sleep just sleep 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 he wouldn't get up wow so, yeah, he started falling really behind academically. Um, he wasn't able to finish high school um, because of it. And he started, um, you know, really suffering. He couldn't concentrate. Um, we got him, you know, in, in the mental health, uh, behavioral health. And he, it just didn't seem to do much for him. I, and I, I'm not really sure 
he got therapy and case management. He he started using, um, you know, they provided him with the the medication for anxiety and depression, and then and then of course he went into the psych psychosis medications and nothing really seemed to work. You know, I just remember us going through all the medications and they did the, the testing, you know, the gene site testing where they swab and try to find out what is the best medication and um, different types of therapies and rehab where they, you know, um, try to get you involved in social activities and just a variety of things that just seemed to nothing, nothing helped. Um, I also noticed that, you know, in the county behavioral system, he, he really lacked a lot of the support he needed also. He needed, you know, something more more serious, but then at the same time, I couldn't get him the help he needed because um, of the way our laws are set up. By that time, he had turned 18, and he could say what he wanted and what he didn't want, and I had no say-so in that. And um, even when they're very young um, and mental health, you know, a lot of things are just between the client and, and the therapist. So. Um, I don't use, you know, parents don't really have access to a lot of things. Um, well, and you, you, things, you and know, you, they don't have privy to that information, so. And Michelle, I mean, you're a mom that really took initiative and went all out to try to find him help. I mean, the, the, mm -hmm. the labyrinth of what it is you must have had to go through to mm -hmm. find the, the, the resources for him because I don't think that these things are very easily to obtain you know no, they're not. just they're even not. getting and just even getting into counseling can be hard yes and once he turned 18 you know it was completely up to him whether he wanted wanted therapy or not he did continue to get it but he just grew progressively worse um, he moved out um, because uh, he wanted to roommate um, and so he began roommating um, but it wasn't until like three months after that um, that there was some significant issues in the household. Um, he, you know, his mental health was seriously declining rapidly. And I kept uh, trying to intervene and sending over um, police to do welfare checks on him. And because of the way the LPS laws are written up, the Latterman Petrus Short Act, um, which is the involuntary hold uh, act. And because of the way it's set up, you know, uh, the officers will go over and they have, you know, uh, they have to ask certain questions. Are you a danger to yourself? Are you dangerous to somebody else? And then are you gravely disabled with the fact that he had an apartment and he had, you know, he was a roommate, he had a place to sleep and eat and he seemed to be, he presents, he still could present well at times. So many, many times, 90% of the times, and maybe even more, uh, the officers would go there and then they would just, leave him there because they said he was fine but in, in reality he was he was uh screaming and crying through the house um the other other roommates couldn't you know relax he was leaving the stove on um so it was always the risk of him burning the house down he was leaving the front door unlocked uh walking outside forgetting where he was and couldn't find his way home um running in the streets half naked or dancing on the on the grass half naked or just scaring some of the neighbors. Um, it got to the point where there were some altercations uh, between him and some of the roommates um, because he just, he just simply wasn't well. And uh, when he started using, um, you know, drinking a lot of alcohol and, and, and smoking, you know, marijuana, it got even worse and the guy wanted him out, you know, so he was at risk of eviction. Um, I was, I would go over and bring him food and many times he was combative and because I had become the enemy basically and you know me and my son were always very close so it was very painful mm. um, but he wouldn't let me in sometimes and his room needed to be clean and he would take the food that I'd bring him you know the groceries and he'd leave them on the floor and he wouldn't put them up and I called the one of the roommates I ended up being able to connect with one of the roommates and she'd say well the, you know the food's been sitting here for hours you know and when I first realized that he was leaving the food out and letting it spoil he wouldn't even put it up you know um but, none of, the, none, disabled, but none of the none of the times you know this is what I always think is interesting that none of the times that the police came over you mm -hmm. know did they do a whole 
long investigation. It was, like you said, just asking a couple of questions. And it just seems to me like anybody could answer questions for a short period of time and look like they're fine. Yeah, and that's, and that's the whole issue with this uh, particular act and the reason why I'm you know, uh, on this mission to reform the LPS Act because it's really flawed and it's affecting families, you know, it's affecting families on every level and, and just trying to get your loved one help, it, it's just, it's nearly impossible. Um, and I had hired an attorney uh, to also try to do a probate conservatorship because I knew what I was up against and I was trying to get my son the help that he needed and so I paid $15,000 on a uh, attorney to do a probate conservatorship and um, basically at the end of the day I came out with conservatorship of the individual person and that's it. I, his psychiatrist at the time would not fill out the form even though they were aware of the fact that I was bringing food and it was spoiled because even though they can't talk to you they have to listen to you and get your report. So I was, I was very uh, active in advocating for my son so when he would go to the hospitals and be on a 5150 I would call the psych hospital and tell them this is what he's doing you know then I would tell his psychiatrist I was regularly you know communicating and it's like you know he's leaving the stove top on he's leaving the door open he's running into the street he's putting himself in areas where he's you know uh, vulnerable to predators he's you know he's not well he's, he's at you know risk of losing his housing you guys need to do something um and so i was jumping up and down you know in every way that i could to try to get the help that i needed um and i even have you know i have all the paperwork of you know everything when he was in the hospital on the temporary lps and um i have the reports that say that the psychiatrist recommended the time frame for him to be hospitalized but the judge released him um and so, you know, even when, when the officers finally, when I finally did get him temporary LPS, um, it was only after I had called over a period of three months, I mean, consecutively calling the police department, I need to check on my son. I need to check on my son. This is what he's doing. And I finally had the sergeant of that area call me and he says, you know, what is going on? We have like all these calls to this address. And um, he says, you know, uh, what, what's exactly going on here, you know? And I just explained it and ran it all down. I said, I just need help from my son. Like, I just need you guys to do something. Like, he's, he's not gonna make it if you don't help him. And uh, so they finally come over and um, there was a good amount of officers, you know, and I, I really don't blame the officers. It's, it's actually the whole, the whole act, the whole LPS act, the whole way it's set up. And because they're only doing what they can do, but then at the same time, uh you know yeah they could be a little bit more investigative but the law the way it's written is if they say yes or no they're not going to hurt somebody or if they can show you that they can provide for themselves and they have housing and food then they're not really disabled so their hands are kind of tied too and um so they send the squ squad cars over and they send this county social worker over and she looks and she gives them an assessment on my son and she tells me Michelle, I'm going to take them, but I'm going to tell you right now, the judge in this case, uh, the judge that sees these uh, clients for the LPS uh, temporary conservatorships and con permanent, um, she just shook her head, and that's all she said. So, Michelle, so, let me, Michelle, let me yeah, ask right. you, um, what, so I'm going to ask you to help me define some of the terminology that you're using. Mm -hmm. what, mm -hmm. what does LPS stand for, and what does it mean? Okay, so in 1967, the California, California addressed the involuntary civil commitment and um, when it passed the LPS, which is Latterman Petras and Short Act, um, to end inappropriate, indefinite, involuntary commitment. Okay, so basically, uh, to put it simply, is back before that time, around that time in the 1960s, we had hospitals, mental hospitals that were, um, you know, uh, having people committed and there was no uh, judiciary, you know, um, uh, uh, act in place. Like, you know, if a, if a family member said this person needs to be committed, they pretty much committed them, okay? Did, they did this act because they felt that people were in there they shouldn't be in there in these psych hospitals and so they put it they put it in place to put protections and safeguard individuals rights through the judicial review and to establish conservatorship programs 
But unfortunately, it resulted in a system that failed to properly address um, the most severe, severely mentally ill individuals in our society, and it also ties the hands of the family that are trying to get, you know, help for their loved ones. So there's a great distance between the LPS Act's original intention was to protect civil rights and make sure that there's a process um, that you know the right people are being held and the right people are you know letting go, being let go. So it's a big distance between what's actually been accomplished and so um there's not enough metrics in place for those who suffer with severe mental illness and don't have insight and awareness to make informed choices about their mental health if you look at a homeless person who has severe mental illness and you ask them you know and they're, and they're messing with drugs too you know you ask them well, well would you like some help would you like to you know just leave me alone you know just leave me alone and you know we see people being left right out of the sidewalks um, and they're severely mentally ill and being left out in the elements and being uh, victimized or a vulnerable population. Some are a danger to other people. And um, it, it's just turned into, uh, you know, this homeless crisis is it, because there's a lot of mentally, severely mentally ill people out there not getting the treatment that they need because they know how to say, they know how to answer the question. They're, all of them know how to answer the question. Yeah. Well, and I think that it, like you said, I think it kind of starts early on where, yeah, parents can intervene, parents can get help, parents can, but even even in some of the cases that I've worked on just as recent as this week, you know, sending a, a, a teenage girl who's um, attempted suicide in the past and who has been cutting and has threatened suicide, um, this was a couple of days ago, having the mm -hmm. police the police take her and the police take her to the county facility and the county social worker asks those questions and in this situation yeah she was deemed worthy of being held for 72 hours against her will but we had no beds mm -hmm. there, there was no place to put her and mm -hmm. you know then the parents wonder okay what am I supposed to do now what mm -hmm. what am I what's what do I do with this you know, 17-year-old girl that's um, suicidal, and you're telling me she needs to be someplace, but then you're telling me there's no place to put her. So right, right. It's just really, really sad, and I can't imagine as a mom, I can't imagine as a parent, so desperate to get help, and you have to work so stinking hard, and at the end of the mm -hmm. day, it it doesn't really remedy anything. No, and see, the act also, what it did was it closed many of the mental hospitals. And so it, it really basically relegated people to jails, prisons, and the streets. Yeah. So they're still not getting the help that they need. This isn't, this isn't addressing the problem. No, it's not. At, at all. Not at all. And, and what is really amazing is that, um, you know, I have this petition going around for my son. It's the, the change.org. Um, my beloved Dijon, and and basically I, I tell his story more in depth in this in this petition and it talks about you know um what the petition is about which is to redefine um and revise the 5150 criteria because every single hold that starts from the very first time that your loved one is held everything has to go through judicial review and so every single time you know so for the initial for example okay you go on the 72 hour hold and to to progress forward to the to the next hold which is i believe the 14 day you have to go through a judge so the psychiatrist and the and the patient goes to the judge and then you know i can't tell you how many times my son was released after the 72 hours because he presented well or he he answered correctly even against what the psychiatrist recommended and so the petition talks about how judges are able to override psychiatrist recommendations for hospitalization because that's the way the law is written well i sat i um, sat i sat in on one of those michelle and it wasn't mm -hmm. i don't know the difference but i will tell you it wasn't even a judge it was a commissioner that mm -hmm. was in the room and all that commissioner did was take information you know everybody could speak and even the client could speak and then it they just made their decision they had never met this person before they had, they mm. really didn't have time to review the document the, yeah. the the commissioner came into the hospital 
to see whether or not this client was going to stay for 14 days. But there was no way that this commissioner could have known all the intricacies that were going on and mm -hmm. in order to make a decision, okay, well, no, now you can go home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think to make it and what, and what's even worse is like, as my son would progress through these stages in the last time, he went all the way through to the temporary conservatorship and he was hospitalized for, third, uh, for three months. Um, you know, each time, of course, like I said, you know, you're like praying and hoping that they'll pass through to the next phase because, and you know that it's, it's real that they could be let go at any minute, you know. Um, and so you get them all the way to that temporary conservatorship and, and that's the last one, you know, the last court date where the judge can say yay or nay. And um, what I don't really completely understand is, you know, my son was given an attorney, which is part of this due process and, and not violating his civil rights because he didn't think he needed hospitalization, of course. He had no insight in that and he was very, very sick. Um, and the attorney that, that is given to them, um, basically, you know, they don't care whether or not your child or, you know, loved one is well enough. If, the, if their client says, I need to get out of this hospital, then that's their job, period. And when I try to uh, converse with her to tell her what has been going on and how severely he needed the help, she did not care to talk to me and uh, she probably could not, I don't know to what degree, but... Um, her job was solely to get my son out of the hospital because that was his wishes. And so the whole setup is completely flawed. Yeah. Well, and, and as a mom, even though Deshaun was an adult, you don't, mm -hmm. you don't get a say. Yeah. I, I just couldn't, yeah. I couldn't imagine knowing what you knew and all the int intricacies of what you knew and nobody considering what you had to say or what you thought was best. Yeah, and what's worse, Stephen, is when um, they let him out of the hospital, you know, he was basically homeless because his, you know, the, the house he had with the roommates was gone, that was done. And um, basically, when the judge asked him where he, he was going to live, because it's all on his paperwork, um, she, he told her, I'll, I'll live at the mission. And my son had never been at the mission a day in his life. He didn't even know what it, what it looked like or what it meant because he had been with me, you know, or at the house where he was roommating. And um, basically uh, that was good enough for her. Now you have a client here, a patient here who's saying that he, the, the psychiatrist is saying he's six to nine months and possibly a year of hospitalization and you're letting him out because you feel that in that moment he's fine. And when you ask him where he's gonna stay, he's gonna stay at the mission. Wow. <laughs> I, I'm just blown away by that. And, and never once, I was outside the courtroom the whole time during this um, hearing, and I was never once invited in, and I was never once involved in it because I guess I just wasn't allowed. But, you know, you would think at bare minimum that it would warrant a judge to say, do you have any relatives? Is there somebody yeah. here that, you know, that I could speak to? I, none of that. It's just basically because he presented well and he said he was going to stay at the mission, and he would be fine. She let him out. Oh, um, I have to be honest. I'm. I think I would. I think I would have been in jail. I think I would have gone <laughs> postal. I mean, I. Yeah. I just admire how you were able to stay focused and and even now just staying committed to your mission to get things changed. It, it's just heartbreaking. And as a as a dad. And I'm sure Renee can comment. I, I just, I, I, I think I have an anger management issue, and I think I would have gone ballistic, Michelle. Yeah, it's it's been very very difficult. Um, the system is so disconnected, and, and there's no streamlining in it at all. You know, when he got out, he was able to go to the Social Security Administration. Um, he had went to uh, one of these clinics, and this particular clinic was not a, a doctor he had seen regularly and this is just how flawed the entire system of mental health in california is he was able to go to this clinic and say you know um they didn't tell him he had just got out of a you know conservatorship he just told him oh i want to be my own payee and i just need a letter saying that i'm well enough well the, 
he gave him this, I guess, whatever examination he did and wrote him a letter saying he could be his own payee. He went down to the Social Security office, gave them the letter. Now, he had a, a SSI for a mental health disability, but this is not a psychiatrist that wrote this letter. This is a physical doctor and wow. so, you know, a medical doctor. And so he writes him the letter because I guess that's just what they do. They just give people what they want and he goes down there and he gets it turned over. Well, I went down there, long story short, uh, I went down there three different occasions and I even went to his psychiatrist and said, you know, this is what has happened. If he gets his hands on his money, he may not, you know, he had, by that time I got him section eight and I said, he's not gonna have the money to pay his bills. You know, he's gonna be at risk of being victimized. Um, you know, he's gonna have all the money he wants to get alcohol and whatever else he desires. And this is just not good. And so the psychiatrist gave me a letter stating that, you know, at this moment he was not well enough to be his own payee. And so I went down there and I told him, you know, he just got out of the hospital. And I even went to, over to the clinic where he had got the letter. And I told that doctor, you know, why would you write him a letter? He just got out of the mental hospital. And, you know, you didn't ask, you didn't inquire, you didn't even search. And so the way the system is, is set up is that there's nothing where they can look in a system and say, oh, this client was just released. You know, there's like yeah. nothing, like there's nothing in place. And uh, SSI, basically, I talked to supervisors, and I was told on three different occasions that um, even though I had the letter from his psychiatrist, that it was their decision. They could make the decision as to whether or not that my son was able to um, handle his own finances, and they had decided that he was capable, and it didn't matter what letter I had. And I said, well, why would you? That's what I asked. And, you know, I'm, I'm out there in the in the office where there's, you know, a bunch of people waiting to be called and there's a glass window. And I, you know, I wasn't lowering my voice because I was upset and this is why, but why would you? Yes, obviously the law is written that you can, but why would you? Yeah. I said, because it's obvious that he's not well. I said, and by you giving him this, he's going to have access to do whatever it is. And he has issues with substance abuse. And she said to me, well, we'll just have to, you know, visit that if it happens. And he starts coming up without the money and, you know, it just, it's just amazing to me. Like, it, 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 I just can't even put it together even still today in my mind, why? So the bureaucracy mm -hmm. and all the red tape, mm -hmm. it, you know, is really what got in the way of Dijon getting some help. Mm -hmm. Because even when he, when he was killed on the train at 4 a.m., on the tracks at 4 a.m. on July 27th, 2019 he um i was told he was intoxicated he had been drinking and so um you know the coroner's office had went back and forth with whether or not it was a suicide or whether it was uh, an accident and they did end up going with an accident because they said of his impairment um mental health wise and the alcohol um so you know there's a lot of things that you know we could try to put together and say well it could have been this it could have been that but the fact remains is that if the judge had not released my son, he would have been in the hospital on that day. Wow. Wow. And just your words about, you know, him being on the train tracks, like um, in, in a prayerful um, stance, mm -hmm. you know, I just can't help but imagine that Dijon was just praying for some kind of relief and relief that he never got. I mean, mm -hmm. the system never gave him the relief that he needed that he deserved and I can't help but at some level that he really wanted that yeah I mean I don't think yeah. that he doesn't sound like a kid that grew up you know nobody grows up with a desire to be mentally ill and on right. drugs or drinking nobody grows up like that and just not having a system not having anybody that reaches out and says yeah let's make a difference let's help you um, I, it's uh, unbelievable it is, and I mean, you know, when a person is suffering from that type of mental illness, you know, like I said, schizophrenia and bipolar, um, and lacks that insight, they don't know that they need help. You have to take them involuntarily, unless you're just going to let them go to the street and die, and that's what many of them are doing. I'm not the only one. Um, there, are, there are a lot of stories out there. It's just starting to get a lot of attention now. Um, and there are some senators that are really on board um, that I have met with. Uh, Senator Warlock is one. Um, he's really on board with trying to solve this issue. Um, yeah, what, and Dr. Drew has a lot of uh, interviews on this very topic. Yeah, if you could 
um, share what is it that you have been recently doing to bring attention to this? I mean, there, I think you've done a lot besides just doing my Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I said I've been, I have met with uh, assemblymen and I have met with senators and, you know, there was a couple of Senate bills in place that in, eventually got shot down. Uh, one of them was Senator Morlock's bill to revise the LPS law, particularly concerning the gravely disabled. Um, but I was told by um, him that it was shot down by uh, behavioral health systems because they felt that it would overwhelm their system to do anything different than what they're doing already. Wow. How that really makes sense, I don't know, because we're talking about lives here. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, that I've also um, uh, done a lot of reaching out with NAMI, um, National Alliance on Mental Health. I've done walks in his honor, um, and I, I plan on doing a whole lot more, obviously, but there was also a uh, ABC interview, ABC 30 interview um, about a brief interview about my son and what happened, bringing attention to the need for change and, and revision and revisiting this, this act. Um, but I will not stop until um, I see a change as long as I have breath in my body uh, in memory of my son because he was incapable of making informed decisions about his own well-being. You're talking about um, not violating his civil rights so what about the need to be taken care of when you're not well any of us can fall, fall mentally ill none of, us, none of us are beyond that and what happens when we become so ill we have no insight into our illness and we say oh we don't want treatment so you're going to leave me out on the street to die basically so um people that are watching and listening what what can what can what can we do what can they do mm -hmm. Well, that link, the change.org petition, um, please read the petition. Um, and if you can find yourself in agreement with the things that I'm trying to change, um, they're all listed there. And if you can find yourself in agreement with that, please sign it and share it with as many people as you can um, so that we can get the petition going. It does have the senators and the assemblymen that fight for mental health care reform. They're well aware of our flawed system and they're diligently fighting um to, to change it and so that gives me more of um the more signatures i have the better um there is a link there also for donations because obviously there is a cost to um keeping the petition going and circulating to uh, advocating for mental health care reform and i was even invited to um new york to speak um and, and tell my son's story with a, uh, a nonprofit there. So sometimes it involves travel um, and writing letters to state representatives. You know, on the change.org link, there are the names of the decision makers, which are Senator Bill, Senator Warlock, and um, state representatives uh, Susan Eggman and Keith Flora, which are they're all four are fighting for mental health care reform and they're they're well aware they're, they're fighting constantly for this. So you can send letters to them if you have stories, share them, you know, don't be silent. And any opportunities um, that might present itself for me to come and speak and tell my son's story, I'm, I'm available. All of my contact information is in the petition.org um, petition, you know, it's all there. So I, I think that sometimes in our world we get going so fast and I think that, mm -hmm. you know, everybody moving 100 miles an hour and um, not taking time to pause and really realize that, you know, this is, this is costing lives. This is a serious issue that can't just be ran over. One of the things that yeah. impressed me when I went to the um, change.org site that you have, um, mm -hmm. I don't know, have you read the comments that people have written? Yes, yes I have. What are your thoughts about that? Well, you know, it's touching a lot of lives and, and there's a lot of people that are desperate. They're desperate to help their loved ones and um, I can't obviously, sorry, I can't bring my son back, but in his memory I can help save other lives. And so that is why I won't stop fighting for, for him in his name, you know. Um, he would want me to do that. 
he, he loved a lot of people. He was just so kind, and he would never want anybody to hurt the way he hurt. Well, for me to read those comments, I needed Kleenex, Michelle. Yeah. I mean, those comments that people wrote on the change.org site, really really were touching and you've got to know as a mom I have my Kleenex <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think you're doing an amazing job thank you it's the only thing that really kind of keeps me strong um, through it and I know that one day I'm going to see him again um, but it, it keeps me strong um, to fight and uh, keeps his memory alive also for me, you know. Well, we're gonna yeah. post We're gonna post everything that you send us, everything that we can, all the links that we um, can get and um, ways of how people can help make a change and make a difference. That's kind of what we're all about is getting the word out there about what it is that really needs to happen in our world today that's, it, it's just, it's just really sad. Mental health is something, and, and here we are in the midst of this huge pandemic, and mm -hmm. you don't hear a lot about mental health out there. You hear, hear a lot about masks and a lot about toilet paper, but oh my yeah. goodness, I just think that we're gonna have so many more mental health issues that come up, and this can't be coming at a better time to make the difference, make the laws different, um, let everybody know that something, something's gotta give, and it's not more bureaucracy, it's more caring for the person because I think we've got yeah. gotten away from really caring for the person and it's sad that it just sounds like Dijon was you know just a number or just another person mm -hmm. that they could you know move off to the side versus really understanding and taking the time to get to know who he was Michelle thank you so much for sharing yes thank you for having me and like I said I, you know it's, it's speaking for those who can't speak for themselves and had I not jumped up and down, even at the point when he passed away, uh, his story would just be, you know, it, it, nobody would even know. Yeah, it would just be pushed underneath the carpet. And I think it's mm -hmm. important for people to realize that we don't know about our kids. You know, they can seem very healthy, but because of the external circumstances that are just in our world, their mental health can change at any time so this is just not about him and that you know he started showing symptoms early in life any of us could come down with some type of mental illness where we are not able to think for ourselves and if we don't protect the vulnerable then what are we doing i mean we're just leading mm -hmm. them to the slaughterhouse and I commend yeah. you as being a mom to keep fighting because the more that you talk, um, you're speaking for a lot of other mothers. Yeah, the general is he was exceptional. Um, he he liked to handle things on his own. He did, I was a single parent, and so he would always tell me, "Mama, it's okay. You know, it's going to be all right." And he never wanted to bother me with things, and he was very quiet and calm mannered. So. A lot of things were well hidden and he just kept them to himself and sometimes people can only be strong for so long you know that's right well you're a good mom keep up the good work thank you so much we will we will definitely talk again and maybe we can do this again if I get a whole bunch of people with questions concerns or comments would you be willing to talk to us again and maybe answer some of the questions Most definitely. all right Michelle have a great weekend thank you thank you both so much bye-bye bye-bye Bye-bye. Pretty amazing story. It is. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad that you were on this Facebook Live with me. I think this is an important message to get out and such an amazing, cute kid. Very amazing kid. That really got shortchanged by the bureaucracy. I just want to... I just want to spit nails at bureaucracy and I'm so glad that we are not a bureaucratic organization and I think in light of what we do and our um, organization Embrace.life, this is part of embracing life. Embracing life doesn't have to do with being wrapped up in red tape. It's getting rid of red tape, it's getting rid of bureaucracy and embracing life. 
and Dijon sounded like he embraced life. He did. And it's unfortunate that the system didn't embrace Dijon. Yes. But I'm glad that he has an amazing mom that's fighting for him. And all those else out there. All right. This is the Human Interactive Lounge. Uh, I am Steve, your host, and my lovely wife, Renee. And we will get all of Michelle's information up on our site on Embrace.life. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.